mobile hunters, are you looking to make the move to saddle hunting this year? Or maybe you just want to add a few new pieces of gear or upgrade your current saddle gear. If that's the case, then head over to tetherednation.com where they've got all mobile hunters covered. Whether you're new to saddle hunting or an old timer, Tethered is your one-stop saddle shop. From saddles to ropes, sticks, ascenders, whatever it is you need, they have you covered. I've personally been using their gear for the past three seasons. Now, my base setup consists of the Phantom Saddle and the Predator platform. And if you're wondering why, I've chosen to use their gear above all else. Here's the cliff notes. They're innovative and pushing the mobile hunting forward overall. They cut no corners and prioritize the safety and performance of their gear. They care about the community that they've created, and their gear allows me to hunt free. And above all else, I like to support good people doing good work. If you're interested in upping your mobile hunting game, then head to tetherednation.com. This podcast is brought to you by Skull Brew Coffee Company. Skull Brew Coffee roasts premium single origin coffee guaranteed to deliver the freshest coffee directly to your doorstep. The kicker, they're 2% for conservation certified and donate 10% of their proceeds back to organizations who support the interests of our hunting community. So go to SkullBrewCoffee.com and pick up one of their three killer roasts and fuel your hunt and fill more tags with Skull Brew Coffee. Welcome to the Truth From The Stand Deer Hunting Podcast, brought to you by Skull Brew Coffee Company. I'm your host, Clint Campbell, and you're listening to episode number 231. Today, I'm joined by the UP bow hunter, Todd Freeman, so stay tuned. What is up, everyone? Happy Wednesday to you. Hope you're doing well. Hope you are feeling fine. I actually just got back from a little um, a little scouting trip, so I'm actually a little late to the game on this. I usually try to get this stuff recorded, wrapped up over the weekend, but I actually am changing gigs, and so this is the in-between week, in-between one gig and the next. Um, and so I'm trying to take full advantage of it and get some get some stuff done out in the uh, out in the timber. So this past weekend. The reason why I'm kind of late to the game on this uh, edit is just I was up in the up in the mountains, took the trailer and headed up there to to get some cameras out and um, met up with my buddy Tom Runscavage, um, who he was on the podcast just uh, I think one podcast ago actually. If you want to go back and listen listen to that, so he was gracious enough since he has some familiarity with the area that I was uh, looking looking at and had been scouting and stuff like that. Um, he was gracious enough to to meet me up there. I was planning to go up this past weekend anyway. He actually texted me and just said, "Hey, I'm going to be up there on Sunday. Um, if you want to, if you want to meet up." And so um, I left here. I had some stuff to do on the uh, on I guess Saturday with my daughter, some horseback riding. And so I left Sunday Sunday morning to meet him. Made the couple hour drive up, took the trailer, and met up with him uh, probably around I don't know, noon or so on on Sunday. Hot, well, hot for this time of year, um, you know, the 80s, you know, 86, whatever it was. So it wasn't it wasn't a pleasant scout, so to speak, <laughs> uh, would, it, would have been a little nicer with some cooler temperatures. But uh, we put in we put in some miles, checked out some more areas um, that I had kind of marked on the map. And he had some interest to check out, too. So we did that together, uh, hung some cameras um, and then hung out that night. We were going to record. I was going to do the up front of this and maybe record a pop podcast, but. Um, we, we decided to instead just enjoy the nice weather and sit out and have a couple pops and just talk, uh, and just cut up and talk and talk deer hunting together. So no formal podcast from that, from that session. Uh, but, but a good time nonetheless. So he had to split after that. And so I spent the night there and got up on Monday morning and there was an area that I wanted to scout. Um, he had, he had hit the, I guess it was the Eastern side of this, of this particular piece of this side of the mountain. And, um, I had interest in kind of in the, in the, in the Western side of it. And so I figured I would kind of hike my way up through that and see what I could see. And so ended up setting up a couple cameras up in that, up in that general area. And actually one of the cameras that I, that I set up, I had hung some cells, um, where I had cell service. There's not much cell service in that general area, but, um, I did find a pocket or two that I was able to set up a cell camera and actually started getting deer on camera as early as, uh, last night slash this morning. Um, so, you know, Tuesday, Monday night into Tuesday morning. So pretty excited about that. Cause you, you know, these new places, like I've said in the past, this place doesn't have a ton of sign necessarily. So 
you're really looking for, you know, very like, <laughs> I guess, minimal sign and, and hoping that at least for me, because I'm not familiar with the area and hoping that you're setting your camera in the right spot and that you're going to pick something up. Um, and so this particular area that I was getting some action on the camera, it was actually a scrape, uh, a set of scrapes that I'd found. And they were, just, you know, when I went back this past weekend, the one scrape was still open. It was clearly had been tended, you know, recently. Um, and so it gave me some hope that, you know, deer were still kind of moving through there that, and it was one of the only areas that I found a trail that was pretty significant where they clearly were using, um, this little crossing. Um, and then that's where the scrape was at. And so I felt pretty good about setting up a cell camera there. So, so did that and then, uh, ended up busting my way home and I'm going to make quick work of this up front because I have, uh, I, I am actually going to get out today yet again and uh, put up some cameras. I'm trying to get all my camera work done for the most part this week, at least in some of the harder to reach areas where I have some time that I might need to one place in particular, I need to map out access. And so that's actually what I'm going to do today. Since I have a little bit of cool weather today, I think the high is only supposed to be in the mid seventies. So I figured today would be a good day to go out, do that, map out my entry and exit and hang a camera in that, in that particular area. So with that, we're going to go ahead and get ready to jump into today's podcast. But before we do that, a quick note from our buddies over at Exodus Outdoor Gear. You know, I'd mentioned it last week in the podcast. That they were teasing something that was coming up. But now I can actually let the cat out of the bag. And this month actually marks their sixth anniversary of being in business. As you guys know, I've been working with them for years. And in order to celebrate, they're sharing some great savings with everyone who listens to this podcast to help everyone get ready for Velvet Fest, which is upcoming here in the very near future. So starting right now until June 11th, use the code YEAR6 to save 20% on Exodus Render, which is their cell camera, the SP18, which is the solar panel for any of their cameras and the Render SP18 bundle. So that's a cell camera and the solar panel together. It's, so if if you're not familiar with all the stuff, all the products that Exodus has, the Render is their cell camera, like I just mentioned, runs off of uh, Verizon 4G LTE and has some of the fastest transmission times in the entire industry. And on top of that, it's about as user-friendly as you could possibly you could possibly get. I set up three cameras last night, actually, and probably it was under 10 minutes, and I had all three cameras activated and working. I highly suggest, as I'd mentioned, using their 12-volt solar panels with any of the Exodus cameras. Um, the SP18 Render Bundle is part of the anniversary sale, and the, that duo allows you to set the camera and forget it. I literally put out cell cameras last year in a particular area uh, at the beginning of June and was still getting pictures this morning, have never touched it, never changed batteries, never did anything except set it and forget it, and over a year later, it's still rocking. Over the last six years, Exodus has consistently shown that they build quality trail cameras that flat out work. And of course, the best trail camera warranty, period. Every single camera is backed by the five-year warranty and even comes with a theft and damage coverage. That's right, five years, literally half a def decade, and you'll be covered with the Exodus five-year warranty. But more than likely, you won't need it because their cameras are already built to last. So be sure to take advantage of the savings opportunity and use the code YEAR6, that's Y-E-A-R, the number six, and you'll save 20% at checkout when you head to ExodusOutdoorGear.com. This offer only lasts while supplies last, which usually isn't too long when you do these types of deals. So head over to web their website, ExodusOutdoorGear.com, and be sure to give my buddies over there some support. So now with the housekeeping out of the way, we'll go ahead and get ready to jump into today's podcast. I have the UP Bowhunter on. Uh, if you're not following him on Instagram, give him a follow at UP Bowhunter. But uh, Todd Freeman is a good buddy of <clears throat> of uh, my our mutual friend Greg Litzinger, and that's kind of how I was intro introduced to um, to the to the UP Bowhunter. And this and this session is really part one of a two part series that we'll do together, or a two parts you know episode that we'll do together, just because it was super long. I mean, we talked for almost two hours. And we ran, we spanned everything from shed dogs to growing up in the UP to obviously, you know, bow hunting in New Jersey where he currently lives and traveling out of state and, and everything in between. So really cool session. And today's session, you know, is part one, number one. And what we really focus on is a little bit of, you know, uh, Todd's background growing up in the UP. Actually, we, we jump into a little bit of trapping and how that kind of influenced and, you know, his, his brother, who was a big trapper growing up. Um, influenced his his hunting kind of trajectory and, and, and some of the takeaways uh, takeaways from that. And then, of course, we then transition into uh, into deer hunting and what he's into now. So with that, we'll go ahead and get jumped into today's podcast. And as always, I want to thank you all for listening. All right, folks, welcome back to another episode of the Truth from the Stand Deer Hunting Podcast. And today I have a fellow on who 
admittedly has taken me way too long to have on. We have a very good mutual friend in, in the bow hunting fiend, and this is a fellow he spent some time with. And Greg has been telling me, he's like, man, he's like, you've got to have UP bow hunter on. You've got to have UP bow hunter on. And I've been meaning to, and I was just saying before we started recording, it's like, there's a, like a hundred million people you want to try to have on and 52 weeks in a year to make it happen. So today I have on none other than Mr. Todd Freeman, the UP bow hunter. How's it going, man? Going good, Clint. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, man, you bet. So how's, uh, so I know you're, we might have a little interruption. We'll go ahead and set that, set that up, set that story up. Now we got, we have some family members that might be coming home and a dog that might be seeing his mama. So we might have a little, a little, uh, canine disturbance, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'll, yeah. I'll try to make it as quick as possible. As soon as she comes in the door. Though, so. Oh man, it's no, it's no worries. I've got one too. And he's, he's like my best friend, my shadow essentially, but he is certified. Yeah. He, he's certifiably crazy. Like, yep. I, I've told you got a lab too, right? Yeah, I've got a lab too. And it's, it's, so I had yep. a lab when I was growing up, when I was a kid, mm-hmm. um, and hadn't had one since. And I've always had like, you know, I had a lab growing up. I had a shepherd growing up. And then my dad got into like, um, I had a chow chow growing up. I had, <laughs> I had a golden, okay. I had golden retrievers. That was really what stuck with my dad. And my stepmom was like having golden retrievers and stuff and, right. uh, awesome dogs. And then when I, like moved away i ended up having you know rottweilers is what i had and um and uh english mastiffs that was the those okay, were the breeds well, i usually yeah. had um and so my daughter wanted a dog and like just a good family dog you know and i was like oh cool i was like a lab you know something i can take out in the woods with me that'll be you know gain to enough energy to want to go scout and stuff like that and uh i yep. just did not realize like their personality like how attached to their people they are and they are yeah, they're they're a really really tight dog. This is um, me and my wife have been married 29 years, and uh, this is our third lab, our, our uh, second chocolate male. Mm-hmm. He's 18 months old. Um, his name's Archie Bunker. <laughs> he's, he's had a, he's had a shed antler in his mouth since the day that actually since the day that we picked them from, in, from the litter. I left one with the breeder nice. for him. <laughs> I think they were all all the I never seen it again. They were probably all chewing on it, nibbling on it, and what, whatnot. But uh, right. And then he had the day that we picked him up. He carried one. For, he was eight weeks old or whatever, and he carried one up to, to the car with him. And, nice. and uh, my son. So, yeah, he's been around antlers his whole his whole life. That's awesome, man. Yeah, it's uh. Yeah. So we rescued this one that we have. Okay. Um, he was in a bad situation, so we 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 took him from from those folks. Um, and he's, a, he's a great dog. I just wasn't ready for the, how tight they are to their people because I had, you know, Rottweilers and, and, mm-hmm. you know, Mastiffs and they're really kind of lazy dogs. And like, if you want to engage and play with them, like they're happy to do it. But if you're, if you want to go to like a different room and do something else, like they're happy just to hold the floor down wherever they're at, you know <laughs> I mean? It's like, they don't need to, they don't need to be right on top of you. And I kind of got used yeah. to that, you know? And so it drove me crazy for like the first year where I'm like, I would turn around and he's like standing right there looking at me like, Hey, what are we doing, man? What are we doing? Where are we going? You know? I'm just, exactly. Yeah. I'm just like, Oh, yeah, my- yeah, there's no break. There's no break from being a, uh, the, 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 the owner of a, a Labrador. That's for sure. Yeah. And so I've learned to embrace it, you know, and how I did that was mm-hmm. I just started taking him everywhere with me. You know, it's like I go scout, he goes with me, I go camp, you know, he goes with me, you know, it's just like, if I'm going somewhere that he, there can be a dog with me, I just, he goes, you know, and, yeah. and since then, like, you know, now we're like best buds. Like, I just couldn't imagine not, not having him. And so now I'm trying to teach him how to find sheds and, uh, yep. he's learning, you know, I'm trying to teach an old dog, new tricks. That's what I'm trying to do. So we'll, yep. we'll see. He's, he's does okay in the it's yard, in just, yep. but it's in there. You just got to figure out how to get it out of the plant. Yeah. He, he trust me. He, he can find shit. Yeah. He's just got to figure out how to get him to do it. That's it. And he'll find him in the yard pretty good. You know, it was funny because, like, I never, like, I'd play fetch with him. Like, I, I mean, he's a smart dog. Labs are smart, you know. So I, mm-hmm. you know, and I used to train dogs, you know, whenever I was in my early 20s, obedience training and stuff. I worked for a breeder. And, um, oh, and so, like, I could get him, I can get a dog to work for me, not in the sense of like hunting or whatever, but I can get it to be obedient and do what I needed to do. And I can train him off leash and, and all those things. Right. And so getting him mm-hmm. to like fetch or like get the paper. It's like, I trained him to get the paper in like three minutes and like every Sunday morning I let right. him out. He goes, grabs the paper, brings yeah. it back, you know? And, um, uh, and so then I just started thinking, I was like, man, I was like, I, I, I was like, I bet I could get him to find sheds, you know? But the thing was, it was like, anytime you'd play fetch with him or anything, he never wanted to use his nose. He just always wanted to look, you know, like he would right. run, he would run right by like a ball you would throw if, 
like if he didn't see it, he'd mm-hmm. run right by it. He would never use his nose. And so it was just kind of cool whenever I started using a shed with him, you know, and kind of playing with him and playing fetch and then hiding it from him, like watching him, like truly watching him work. Cause I never saw him do that before and like watch right. him work the yard and like, he'll start kind of running, work in circles around the yard to try to pick up a scent and stuff like that. And it was just really exactly. cool to watch. And like, and now he's finding them when I hide them, when I'm planting them, you know, That's he just does. Deal. Yeah. Yeah. He's doing really well. I'm going to have, I'm going to try to have my buddy, Tony Peterson on. Cause he's, you know, obviously really good with dogs. Um, yep. and I want to talk to him about it a little bit because I need to figure out what I need to do in the field with him a little bit more because I had him out in the woods here like a week or so ago, we were doing some scouting and, um, you know, I, I took a shed with me that way he would find one, you know, like he, he wins mm-hmm. every time we go out and we were kind of scouting and we were close to this bed that Greg and I scouted this area. And we found this bed. And so I was like, well, if there's going to be a shed around here, it might be around here somewhere. And so I just said, Hey, find the sheds, find the sheds. And he started kind of looking, but then he got kind of confused. Cause he's like, Hey man, we ain't in the backyard. You know, he's like, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what I'm doing, you know? And so he got a little, he got a little confused, I think. And then I, I planted one for him and he found it and then we called it a day, but I need to figure out how to transition him from the yard to, to the woods yep. is, my, is my next step. So when, when Archie was a pup, I don't, I don't want to hang on this too long, but when Archie was a pup, when he was real little, you know, eight, nine, ten weeks old in four months and whatnot, um, what I would do is if I would throw one out there or throw a plant and he lost track of it or I throw it and it started training in uh, taller grass, mm-hmm. I would always know where it was at. And if he couldn't figure it out, what I would do is I would never bring him to the shed. But what I would always do is try to figure out which way the wind was blowing yeah. and take him in 10 yards downwind of it. You know what I mean? Yep. So he would start to learn that you have to get down. You know what I mean? Yep. Use your nose. And, and now it's just when he, I'm not saying that he's a good shed dog yet. You know, he's like I said, he's 18 months old. This winter was his first winter and he found a few. Right. But the, the you can see when he is on, what you're on a shed or, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because he just, his whole body just, you know, he's like a, um, well, that's what he's, he's doing what a retriever is supposed to do. You know what I mean? He's, he knows he's here. He just doesn't know where it's at. His whole body just changes demeanor, you know? Yeah. yeah. And I've, I've watched that with Rocky too, where it's like, he'll get close. I've done that too, where it's like, I've walked him down wind to try to get him to get close so he could smell it. And when, as soon as he does, man, it's like, Mm -hmm. He'll get tight to the ground, you know, he stiffens up, you know what I mean? A little bit. And, you know, it just, he'll start working a little like perimeter around it, trying to figure out where it's at. And then you can almost, I can watch, it makes me think of deer because, and this will be a trend, you know, we can transition into deer hunting here in a second, but you know, deer smell almost at the molecular level. Right. And so I could watch Mm -hmm. him go by it and he could tell he was getting just a little too far away that the scent profile was getting weaker and and he would just turn right around. You know what I mean? Like yep. he, he knew he was like right on it and like, Oh, two steps this way. It's a little weaker, you know, and he would just start to zero in and then he would eventually find it. And it's just super cool to watch him work. And so I'm hoping he really takes to it. Cause you know, it's just, um, adding that to the woods. Like when you're scouting, would just be super cool for me. Cause I've never had a shed dog, you know, and that would just be, you know, not to sound all corny, but totally take like he and I's relationship to the next level. You know, if, if he's able, if he's able to do that, I mean, he's a great dog as it is a great family dog, but and I love spending mm-hmm. time in the woods with him, but if he can do that at the same time, then it's just like, you know, it's just different, different level, I guess. Yeah. It, it, it's just good to, you know, to, to have a walking partner, man. It, yeah. we, our, our, our last lab um, died probably 10 years ago or something mm-hmm. like that. Now we, we went about seven years, eight years, something like that without a, you know, without having a walking yeah. partner. And it, it, it sucks. You yeah. know what I mean? It yeah. doesn't <laughs> suck. I mean, you put the sheds and stuff like that, but, it's always good to have your dog with you. It really yeah. Is. Yeah. I, I find yeah. myself, I'm willing to stay out and scout longer when he's with me. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Just cause I got a buddy there that's, that's with me. Now he does still want to be on top of me in the woods, which drives me a little crazy. And when he gets tired, he walks behind me and lets me blaze the trail through the brush. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like when he's not tired, he's all over the place. As soon as he gets tired, he's like, Hey, I'm just gonna mm-hmm. walk right behind you. <laughs> you know? So, but yeah. Which means he's a smart dog. He's not stupid. Like he knows what's up. He's like, I'll let the, I'll let the human blaze the trail here. I'm going to just go ahead and take her easy. But anyway, (laughs) we're going to transition back to what we intended to talk about here, which is, you know, and what we always talk about on this podcast is, which is some form of deer hunting. But, uh, Todd, I appreciate you coming on, man. But before we jump into things specifically, I always kind of like to break the ice to a degree and just have people kind of share where they're, you know, where they're from, what they do for a living. So people kind of get a sense of a little bit about who you are. All right, so uh, my name's Todd Freeman. Um, I'm the UP bow hunter on Instagram and, and 
the old form, all the old forums that used to be around the hunting beast, the blood brothers and the archery talk. There's all right. kinds of old ones. <laughs> um, I'm showing my, my age a little bit here. Right. But, uh, mostly, most of the time, whenever I could grab the handle, UP bow hunter, I was, I've always been a UP bow hunter. And, um, um, the UP bow hunter, uh, stands for upper peninsula of Michigan. Or, mm-hmm. Um, and you know, that's where I grew up. I, first 18 years of my life i grew up there you know born and raised just a poor country kid south of marquette in the upper peninsula on the uh, lake superior uh um shore uh fishing for everything you you can think of and hunting and (laughs) just doing everything you possibly could do outside um grew up i was fortunate enough i was blessed enough to grow up with just a big huge chunk of woods that you could walk for miles right and uh tree forts and all that kind of good stuff out in the woods and you know shooting squirrels with your bb gun and yeah, yeah. <laughs> the kids can't do nowadays but you know my, my our, back in those days you know your mom would kick you out at eight o'clock in the morning in the summertime get that's, out that's she right she didn't have to kick me but i was already at, at the creek back there fishing for brook trout and stuff so right that's... um so grew up there went in the navy when i was 18 um my first ship was in the philadelphia naval shipyard it was getting overhauled at the time, and um, I was there for about a year, and and I uh, ran into my wife Marcy. Um, she's a South Jersey girl. Um, through some mutual friends and whatnot, we met and started dating, and man, it was probably less than a year later we got married out in California, <laughs> in San Diego, California. Nice. <clears throat> I bounced around. Um, we came back here for a couple of years in, in South Jersey. So I bow hunted a lot in South Jersey back in those days. Um, you know, you couldn't bait. Mm-hmm. And I grew up in a baiting state in Michigan. So I learned, basically learned to really learn how to deer hunt when I was 20, 21 years old when we like, right. you know, started hunting here. Um, anyway, bones all over the place with her uh, in the Navy, when I was in the Navy. Um, and then we decided um, when I got out to, to move back here to where she's from because I, I like loved her family and mm-hmm. whatnot and been, been living in South Jersey ever since. Um, we've been married 29 years. I said that earlier. Um, mm-hmm. I work right now. I've been in the maintenance most of my life right now. I'm currently working for a um, water treatment mm-hmm. uh, company. I'm a sales and service rep mm-hmm. for, for them. And nice. um, that that's it. Nice. So with that, so what's your, I guess, shifts like, like, do you get a fair amount of time to time to hunt? Like I've, I've had a couple guys on that have, that have made me envious that are, that work in the health care spaces, like, you know, RNs or physicians assistants and stuff like that, that like work, you know, three, 12 hour shifts and have three or four days off or work seven tens and have, you know, the seven days off. So they're off every other week. What's, what's your, what's your schedule look like? Yeah, my schedule is basically, uh, eight, eight to three, eight to five, mm. somewhere, somewhere in there, depending on what, you know, what the, the work load looks for, like for the day. Right. So, right. Now yep. growing up in the UP, did you like, did you come from a hunting family? Was that just something that, that it was yeah. inevitable that you were going to do? Or was it just like proximity close to like a, a wilderness area that you just naturally fell into it? Well, to be completely honest with you, I think, I think there was 250 people in my class. And I think there was probably three boys that didn't, three men <laughs> right. that didn't hunt. You know what I mean? So, right, right. You know what I mean? And uh, they all live in New York City now or San Francisco or something. I don't know exactly where. But, right. But you know what I mean? So they, they were just weren't, you know, they just weren't, uh, it wasn't in their DNA. Right. It's like, it's, it's in, in that area. In your DNA, yeah. Right. In that, that area, it's culture. Things. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yeah. I mean, school shut down for a week. You didn't, you didn't have to, you basically, school did not shut down. I mean, there would be classes, but you didn't even have to have a note right. for the week. So it's a little bit different than most of the people that I know from PA. Yeah. yeah. School actually shut down. Our schools didn't shut down, but you didn't even need a note from your parents right. to not be there that week. You know what I mean? Because yeah. everybody knew you were out at your, out at your camp. So yeah. Um, the, cult, the culture there is a lot like Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. In the fact that um, most people have a home, and then especially in the northern tier of Pennsylvania, and they'll have a camp 30 or 40 miles away, 
in in the in the wilderness, and that that's exactly the way it is in the Upper Peninsula. Right. Um, in those days, when I was growing up in the late seventies and the early nineties or early eighties, um, we had you you're not going most people aren't going to believe this now, but we had Wisconsin and Illinois tags. I mean, the, the majority of the hunters were from Wisconsin and Illinois. Hmm. They would come up to the Upper Peninsula to hunt. They didn't have deer hmm. back then. They had very few deer. Their herd was starting to expand, um, and then there was there was a lot of um, uh, you know agriculture change in the in the sixties and seventies that started to make it so the deer population would pick up down the farm lines. But the farms back in those days were not good hunting. It, right. it, it wasn't good. You know what I mean? So they would come up for the culture of being in the big woods and being part of a deer camp. Right. In in those days. And they bought a lot of our camps. I mean, they're all sold back to the Youpers now, but right. um, yeah. Yeah. Youpers. And that's, day, they, that's an yeah. interesting word. Cause I'd never heard that before. You texted me the other day when we were texting back and forth. You're like, I don't, I think it might be the first Youper on your, on the podcast. And I'm like, Youper. I'm like, I don't even know what that is. So <laughs> explain what a youper is for people out there that are listening that might not know. Yeah. So there, there's a bunch of people um, that are from the UP that, that will know the term and other people in the surrounding areas, the Michigan people all know it. But um, so the upper peninsula or the UP is, um, is a one fourth the land mass. It's the upper peninsula of Michigan. It's um, you know, we got Lake Superior to our north and Lake Michigan and Lake Huron to our south and Canada to our east, uh, Wisconsin to our west. So um, there's two peninsulas of, of Michigan. You hear, if you ever heard anybody talk about the thumb or the mitten or anything like that, that they're mm -hmm. talking about the lower peninsula. And right. if you ever hear them talk about, if a person from Michigan says I went to northern Michigan, they're not talking about they went all the way up. They're talking about they went to the top of the mid or the top of the lower peninsula. Okay. In, you know what I mean? Before they got to get to the bridge. We call people from the lower peninsula trolls because they live below the bridge. It's, it's separate. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. So we call them trolls. <laughs> it was nice. always a joke. You know, they were flatland trolls down there. Um, right. Yeah. That's funny. <laughs> so, That's funny, man. Yeah. So how did, you know, I can't, I mean, I grew up in the country. I grew up in a rural, rural areas so i can kind of you know I, I can jive with what what you're what you're talking about as far as like the culture and stuff like that because you know mm -hmm. we had you know the first day of deer season off every or first day of buck season and first day of doe season every you know every year it was a day off from school uh both days mm -hmm. um you know i graduated with like a class of i think there was 93 in my class okay um yeah so super super small right you know super super rural where it was the same thing as you mentioned it was like I don't even know. I can think of maybe one person in our class, like, you know, kid, you know, guy that didn't hunt growing up, you know what I mean? I can think, mm -hmm. I can literally probably only think of one that I could name. Um, you know, and it was just one of those things where it was a rite of, rite of passage. And I know for me, you know, even though I wasn't really bow hunting then necessarily, cause I didn't start bow hunting until I got, you know, a little, I was probably 30 when I first picked up a bow. I mean, I'd always hunted, but you know, I didn't pick up a bow cause my dad, I never, I've told this story before, but my dad never really did a lot of bow hunting. He would, he would go out and he would hunt with a recurve in the fall, you know, whenever there would be a lot of wind or rain cause he preferred to stalk. I never was in a elevated tree set up until I was 30. You know, we always hunted from okay. the, everything we ever did was either hunting from the ground or still hunting. That was how I learned how to hunt. Um, yep. and, and so it's like, for me, it was, you know, not until I got a little older and like it certainly shaped, you know, how I, you know, it shaped me as a, as a hunter. There's certain things that I did really poorly because of that, <laughs> you know, um, and had to like unlearn some bad habits. Um, you know, but there were certain things that, you know, were really, were really helpful. And one of them was patience, right? Cause you know, it was a hard state to hunt. And this is obviously before antler restrictions and stuff like that, where you didn't see a lot of bucks, you know? And so you had to be willing to kind of grind it out if you were going to see anything just based on, you know, the area that I lived in and the area that I hunted. So, I'm curious for you, man, you know, and then I know maybe you didn't get into bow hunting like a little bit later or really get into hunting whenever you maybe were like in the Jersey area, but you know, growing up being in the woods and in like a wilderness area like that, how did that mm -hmm. looking back on it now, how did that, or how do you think that shaped you as a hunter early? Well, the thing about it, I think a lot of your listeners are going to have a hard time 
maybe relating to, and, and maybe they they won't. But where I grew up, like there's people to this day up in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan that live off the land. There's okay. guys that trap and do what they have to do, living in the woods <laughs> to survive. Right. You know what I mean? And I was lucky enough in my lifetime to be around a lot of men that were like that. Right. You, you know what I mean? Not yeah. necessarily that they were hermits or whatever, but they were men that didn't have a normal 40 hour job. Right. That, you know what I mean? Where they went and clocked in, they went and lived off the land. They did what they had to do off, you know, living off the land to survive. And Whether it was selling fur or catching there. fish or whatever it was. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yes. So, I was fortunate enough to be around people like that and, and learn a lot of things. Now, uh, you know, like trapping never really clicked with me. Um, hmm. My brother is a big time trapper. He's a, okay. a shitty bow hunter. <laughs> <laughs> he's a good shot. He knows what he's got to do, but he doesn't have any patience. He okay. can't sit there long. You know what I mean? Like right, right. He, he would be a killer because he can put a, he can put a mink foot in a trap. Right, but yeah, and he, he can do he can read deer sign. I learned more off of him about deer sign when we were growing. He's three years younger than me. Right, you, you know what I mean. I learned more off of him about deer sign than he ever will ever know how much I learned off of him. Right, but I would take the information and I would go out in the woods and I'd sit there. Right, you know what I mean and, until I killed something. He has a hard time sitting, and 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 you know that's one of the reasons why. He needs to stick to walleye and 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 uh, <laughs> crap. And, <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> Here's this, he's gonna he's gonna last. But, so, but he, yeah. So, so these 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 older. Uh, imagine I'm just imagining in my head, and they may not be older, but I'm thinking just like when I think of you know guys like that that live. I'm thinking of like some old timers and stuff like that. But I mean, it's clear that there are still people that are doing that, so they're not old timers necessarily. Yeah, but but I mean, Clint, when I say that, I don't mean like there's guys that are out in the woods twenty four seven, but there's guys that are trappers. They they shoot coyotes in the wintertime. They they do taxidermy. They do, you know what I mean? All right. the different things that you can live off the land. And those trappers, those guys have more knowledge than we'll ever have. Oh, my. Yeah. On, on how to kill critters. Yeah. They really do it. If, if a man wants to get good at, at hunting, he needs to really learn how to trap. And, and so, I, I know other people have said this, but it's the God's honest truth. Right. So it, it really is. That's a perfect kind of segue because that's what I wanted to ask you was like, mm -hmm. what, like, what is it in, you know, those are super formative years, right? So even if like, like you had mentioned, like you really didn't even, like you said, I didn't really learn how to hunt, you know, quote unquote, right. Until I was in my twenties. Right. And like, so like, I think I, I understand what you're getting at where it's prior to that. It's like it's playing around, figuring stuff out, having fun. Right. And it's like, you're kind of yep. floating around cool. like a feather in the wind and not quite sure where you're going to land. Right. But that's also where you do a lot of like experimentation and, and learning and, yeah. and, and figuring out. So I'm just curious, you know, growing up in that area around people, cause I, I didn't have that necessarily. Like we, I didn't, I never knew anybody mm -hmm. that trapped and I always wished that I, that I would have grown up around someone like that. I, and I wish I had the patience to learn more about it. Cause I just truthfully don't, you know, it's just not one of those things mm -hmm. that I have that I'm um, patient enough to kind of, to learn and understand. And I should be more patient with it, but right. what are some things from like some guys that were around there that you grew up that were trappers or whether it was your brother, or even though it was younger or whatever it was, like what were some of those lessons that you took from that, that later in life you were like, Oh man, this is how this really gets applied. Well, I, I think for one, like scent, you know, mm -hmm. scent, um, and just how critters use scent. Um, I think, um, you know, really just being in the woods mm -hmm. for one, you, you know, those guys are all, they try to always be in the woods. I mean, they're, they're happy when they're in the woods, you know what right. I mean? And, and it, the, the one thing that you learn about if you're in this bull hunting game long enough, I mean, especially when you're young and you're learning being in the woods is where you learn. Yeah. There's no substitute. You, you, can take and listen, you can listen to people tell you things and this and that, but when you get in the woods and you actually go out and do it, mm -hmm. those are the things that are going to really be pounded in your head. Now there's going to be some things that people tell you along the way that, that tell you, you know, yeah, the deer do this and deer do that, but you, and, and you can believe them, especially if they're people that you trust and you know, th that you feel confident in what they're saying. But when you actually go out in the woods and see it, 
or you see something like that and you say, oh, that deer is doing what that guy told me yeah. or, or, or whatnot, you know, um, trappers are a little bit different than hunters. I mean, w- one thing about trappers is they, for the most part, they have long, long lines and right. they have to do a 24 hour check or whatnot. So they're trying to be efficient when they're in the woods, you know, and they're, they're bouncing from, from place to place to place. They're looking for not only critters, but they're looking for other trappers to see if other trappers are in the area. Right. Yeah. You know, th- there's a lot of, you know, um, connectivity between trapping and hunting. You, it's the same kind of things that you have to look for when you're, when you're scouting a piece for, for hunting, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. For, for bow hunting as well. You know what I mean? How are other trappers u- utilizing this? Um, I think trappers, like I said, they have to be a little more efficient because they might have a hundred traps they have to check every day. Right. You know right. what I mean? So they're, yeah. they're not going to, unless they have something, uh, they're not going to have one specific trap that's two miles back. Right. That's just a complete waste of time for one critter. Right. Every 24 hours. You know what I mean? They have to have things set up and, and they're boom, 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 boom. Um, one thing you learn about them is they're really reliant on their equipment. They, hmm. and, and bull hunters can take that as well. You know, and putting your pack and your in, in your equipment together to be efficient. And you're yeah. in the woods and you're doing things quick and fast. Trappers, they may look like slobs. They may look like hairy old gray-haired men that got big old beards and they're dirty because they got muskrat grease on them and everything else. But those guys are efficient. When they when they when they pull up to a, a culvert or whatever, it it is boom bang. Boom. And you know what I mean? They're back in their truck. You right. know what I mean? They open their tailgate, they're grabbing this, they grab that, boom, they go down there, smack a thing on, smack a critter on the head, reset the trap, and they're up there, throw the critter in the back of the truck, and boom, they're gone. Right. You, you know what I mean? Let's move. Yeah. And, and, I, and I'm just going to say, I think the one thing that you'd mentioned, which is like the, like the take, the big takeaway is like, you know, Trappers, because they're kind of working these long lines and stuff like that, they just spend a, a significant amount of time in the woods. And what you kind of mentioned was learn by doing, essentially, right? Mm-hmm. It's like there's no substitute for being in the timber. And I remember I was talking, I did a podcast with Todd Mead. And one of the things that he said, and like I wrote it down whenever he said it, was that, you know, you become a better deer hunter by being around deer, right? And it's just like what you were mentioning, which is, why is that deer doing that? You're watching him like, oh, he's doing this. Right. And for me, the big kind of aha moment was, you know, you hear people say it all the time. Like, I don't, I mean, I've done, I don't know how many episodes of this podcast I've done at this point, but I don't don't know how many times I've, you talk to like really good bow hunters. And the one thing that they will tell you that's critical in getting a mature deer, you know, in in range to to take a shot is you got to give him the wind. Got to, right. Like you might get, you might get lucky not doing that once in a while, but man, if you want to do it consistently, like you got to be able to give that deer, that deer, the wind. And it's so counterintuitive to do that. Right. And I remember for me, it's like, I was always really nervous to do it because I'm like, I'm going to get busted. Like, you know what I mean? I'm like, there's, there's no way I'm yeah. going to be able to. And, and then I remember the first time I did it kind of correctly, you know, where it worked. And then at that moment, it was like, I saw it. I observed it. I kind of looked at what my setup was and I was like, okay, I get it now. Like I understand, like mm-hmm. I understand like how I need to do this. Like, and it's not going to work hundred percent of the time. There are going to be times where I'm going to get busted, but if I want to have that type of encounter that I just had, this is how I have to do it. Right. And it's yep. that learning through observation and understanding what the deer want, what you can give them to try to put things in, in your, in your favor. So I think yep. to me, that's the big thing, man. It's like, you just got to be in the so timber. It's not, more. A lot different. It's, it's not a lot different than the trapper than either. So the trapper may have been mentored by somebody that showed them everything or they may not have. So if they learn on their own, they learn that, hey, this corner set up, you know, there's a bank, there's an undercut bank right there. And all those critters seem to roll along that, that undercut bank. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And every yep. time I set my trap there, for some reason, I have something. Every 24 hour check, boom, there's something there. So eventually if you if you're a good deer hunter or a good trapper you start to learn hey what is it that that makes this place that i catch this thing at every time so right. good right and then you start eliminate it or figure out what it is oh it's an undercut bank right and the reason why it's undercut is because the outside corner of a creek you know what i mean or right or whatever and you try to replicate that and it's the same thing with deer hunting yeah when, when you find a place that's good and, and you're having success when you're learning 
you replicate it. And then right. next thing you know, it's almost like muscle memory. Right. You, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's almost like muscle memory. I, yeah. I, I love that you said that because that's the one thing that I think, you know, it, and it's not, I'm trying to figure out how to, how to say this. It's, it's not getting married to a spot. Isn't what we're talking about here. Cause I, I'm, I'm totally picking up what you're putting down. It's, it's once you've figured out, not figured out, but once you've learned how to have success, right. Or you've had some success, look back mm-hmm. at those successful hunts and try to figure out like, what was the common denominator between them through with all, of yeah. them, right. What were yep. those things that were done correctly? Or what were those things that put things in my favor to have that encounter and ultimately to release that arrow? Right. Because those weren't coincidences by, by most of the time, especially if you've done it over, several times, right. If, if, if you've done it consistently over time, there are certain things that you're doing consistently, which is the reason why it's happening. And so all you try to do is to do those things consistently time over time, which is going to give you a better opportunity, like, or more, more opportunities. Right. And the other thing you mentioned about the trapper, like that little bank where those critters want to roll or whatever. It's to me, when I, when things I think really started making more sense for me, was when I was able to see something like that somewhere, like just say like around Philadelphia where I live. Right. And then I would go mm-hmm. to Missouri or I'd go to Ohio or I'd go to like wherever. And I could be in a completely different place with completely different habitat and terrain. And I could see something that would remind me of something I had seen in, in a completely different area and be like, Oh, this is how they're going to do that. Right. And yep. so you start building like this catalog and I've talked about this before catalog of analogs to where it's like, Oh, the way this, the way this little kind of like high spot rolls here reminds me of this little high spot that I hunted in this swamp, but I'm in timber here. I bet they're going to use it similarly, or maybe the wind's going to do the same thing, you know? So you start to kind of create yeah. these analogs for yourself to where you can start to hunt new places, but have better hunts earlier in them because you have like this Rolodex of, different experiences that you can draw from and say, Oh, this is going to hunt like this. And it doesn't have to be the same. Yep. doesn't have to be the same habitat, same state, same anything. And that no. to me is like, that's when you start to level up a little bit is like, okay, that place, that little cut in that bank. Well, I don't need to see the same cut in that bank in the same state. I can go somewhere else and it might not be a cut in a bank. It might be where a tree now is overhanging the water's edge that gives it the sim- a similar, I'm just making this up at this point, but or whatever like, it is, yeah. right. Yep, right. It that is. it's yeah. like, Oh, they're going to use this the same way. You know what I mean? So it's creating it, 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 those it's, things. It's the same thing. It's just exactly the same thing as when you're walking through the woods and you're going in a new piece and, and you co- come up to an edge and you look over, there's an opening. And then you look, you look a hundred yards away and you see one tree over there. And you said, I guarantee that tree right there has got a scrape under it. Mm-hmm. Because this is, I've seen this a hundred freaking times before, right? Yeah, I've seen this a hundred times before, and okay, yep, there's a scrape right there, and oh, look at that little tag altar just just another fifty yards past it over there. I guarantee there's three or four rubs right over there in that tag. You know, what I mean? right. and you walk over there, and it's boom, 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 exactly like you could see from a, you know, from a yeah. hundred yards away, one hundred fifty yards away. Yeah, and that's the type yeah, of you know stuff. I mean? If you when you start getting years of experience. And I've said this to other people before, and I think people roll their eyes and stuff like this, but I've killed many bucks by going in with a headlamp in the morning in a place I've never been before, Clint. Mm-hmm. You, you know what I mean? Yep. And just walking in with, with a headlamp yep. at 5 o'clock in the morning, two hours before dark, and I can say, okay, say, oh, look, at, there's, a, there's an opening right here. There's an edge right here. You know, you know, and and just look around because I've seen it. This is I've never been here before, but I've seen it a hundred times. Yep. You, you know what I mean? Yep. Okay. If a deer's coming in here, okay, that's I know that's northwest over there. The wind's gonna be coming this way. The deer's gonna be coming along this edge. I don't want to walk in this opening. I want to cut into the woods a little bit. I'm gonna go 30 yards into this thing. I'm gonna cut over here. I want to get somewhere of the best tree along that edge. You know what I mean? Yep. And, and pick out a tree in the dark and kill a deer that morning. Yeah. It's happened to me many times, yeah. probably a dozen times. Yeah. And it, it, yeah. I was just going to say, and, and that's where, that's where that experience comes in where it's like, you've seen these situations play out over and over and, yeah. and over again. Like I've not gotten, <laughs> I've not gotten to that point. I, you I, have to be, yeah, You have to be smart enough to know and see that and say, okay, that's where the deer is going to come. Not smart enough. Only right. that you've seen it before. You know right. what I mean? 
it's got to be pounded in for me. I'm a real stupid guy. So it's got to be pounded in my, it's been pounded in my t- head a hundred times. Right. Like the deer's going to come this way. And if you walk right here where you think he's going to come, he's going to ground scent you and you're never going to kill him. So right. you need to cut over downwind of it, cut down, you know, go 30 yards inside the wood line and walk down there and then cut back over to the opening and find a tree along there. Guarantee that there's going to be a deer that comes along here. I, right. I guarantee it. Right. And, and, the- and boom. I mean, sometimes you get lucky and it's a four year old. Sometimes you, it's a it's a year and a half year old. You know what I mean? But right, it worked out exactly. It, 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 you may not shoot the spike or the fork or the six or whatever it was a year, year old. The three year old you shoot. I would. I do anyway. I'm I hunt public land. You know what I mean? Right. But the uh, sometimes it works. Sometimes it does. Yeah. But, sometimes sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. I think you know. I think where some people make the mistake is when you were kind of talking about the, your entry net or what your access, right? I think that that's the part, like, I think some, I think some guys, especially if they've been hunting a while, like are able to look at a map, you know, whatever piece of land it is and, and can kind of say, you know, based on what I know about the area or just in general, right. It's like, this is probably going to be a decent setup here, right? Whatever your criteria is, right. Whether you're trying to get away from yep. people or whatever it is, right. You can kind of find certain things on a, on a map and you can kind of start to figure some stuff out. You know, and, and you will, you know, I think at least me, it's like, I'm usually somewhat in the ballpark, you know what I mean? It's yep. and and I think where a lot of folks will, you know, mess it up is that, you know, that's just half the battle. The other half of the battle mm-hmm. is, are you willing to take the long route there and make sure your access is correct to not screw up where you think the deer are going to be coming from before you ever get there and kill yep. your hunt before it ever happens? Right. That, yep, that because I think that's one of the hardest things whenever you're, you know, when you're walking into a place that's new, because, you know, I, I do a lot of, you know, I'll freestyle hunt. You know, I did all of Missouri this year, freestyle hunted that whole trip, you know, and, yeah. you know, and we, we were in, good. Yeah, we yeah, there. yeah, we were in you know deer. I mean? Yeah, we were in deer within, yep. you know, usually two days on each of the three pieces that we bounced to mm-hmm. and stuff like that. And, you know, had some encounters and, you know, it was good. It was just, you know, we were just. 20 yards away this time and 20 yards too far this time. It was just one of those, you know, yeah. luck of the draw type of things. But, but it was the same thing where it's like, we we were scouting, scouting, scouting and saw like these scrapes that were, that were in this area. And it was like, all right, this is where all the pressures come from. This is how people are entering this piece of property. This is the mm-hmm. furthest place South of that. That would be the furthest hike. There's a couple of scrapes here. I bet there's going to be bucks here in the morning. Right. Doesn't didn't feel like an evening spot. It was just a feeling. Right. Like you look at it and how it was set up and it was like, I would never hunt this in the evening, but I would hunt it in the morning, you know, and sure enough, Mm -hmm. went back the next morning, set up on the ground and saw two, maybe three bucks, you know, and it it was just one of those things where it was like I had seen that before and was like you could immediately kind of feel that like this is a morning spot, not not an evening spot. You know, and and I don't know why I thought that, but that was immediately what I thought. I was like, I'd never hunt this in the evening. I'd only hunt it in the morning. You know, mm-hmm. and it was just because I had seen that kind of set up before, you know, somewhere else and just had a feeling that that's what would happen and kind of felt like the deer would come from this direction. And sure enough, there they were, you know, so mm-hmm. it's, you know, it's just a matter of kind of, you know, spending enough time in the timber and seeing enough things. You start to, you can start to kind of play it out in your mind before it happens. And you do. And, and you, you, when, when you talk and you've talked to a lot of a, a very experienced hunters, but the one common denominator that people with ex- real experience will tell you, you know, in, in the same class, those guys. But what you hear a lot of the, those guys say is if your gut tells you to do something and it adds, it, everything adds up into mm-hmm. good, solid deer hunting and your gut is telling you to do something, do it. Yeah. When you start building up your experience, and your gut, the gut is telling you to do something. Mm-hmm. Go do it. You, yeah. you know what I mean? Jump on it right now. I mean, this is this might be your one day to hunt this week, but your gut is telling you to go do it. Go do it. You know? Yeah. I, I'm a primarily a, 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 a Saturday morning hunter. I mean, mm-hmm. that's really what I what I have generally been able. To most of my my hunting career is Saturday mornings, and um, I know a lot of guys, and I. I been on the hunting beast the blood brothers before that and they're all evening guys and all that kind of stuff and i love all the guys that have always been on those those things but i'm a morning guy so it's it's Uh, funny it's funny because you and greg both are 
And that's the yeah. thing, you know, in, in like in Cody DeQuisto is right. Like it's like, there's a handful of dudes I know who are morning guys. And like, I, I'm, I'm trying to be, <laughs> you know, um, it's, uh, I'm not there yet. That's one of the things that I constantly right. is on my list every year of getting better is like honey mornings, especially in like October. All right, folks, that is a wrap for today's show. I'd like to thank all of you for listening. And if you haven't yet, please head over to iTunes and leave us a five-star rating. And hell, while you're at it, head over to YouTube and give us a sub there, too. I'd be super appreciative if you'd be able to do those two things for me. And before I shut this thing down, I need to give a big shout-out to our partners who continue to help us make this podcast possible. Tethered, Exodus Outdoor Gear, Skull Brew Coffee Company, and Maven Optics. And until next time, we'll see y'all.